Good morning, St. Paul's family. Welcome to our worship service this morning in Jesus' name. This looks a little bit different than our usual live streams do here as we've been in this season of coronavirus. And if you were part of our email chain, you heard late last night that we uh, were notified that someone who was at the funeral that was in our, our sanctuary last Wednesday had been uh, diagnosed with COVID yesterday. And uh, myself and Pastor Ward and, and Patrick had all been uh, in contact with that person. And so we uh, decided that it was safest and in the best interest of everyone to uh, to cancel church. We couldn't find a substitute uh, with this short of notice. And so, uh, so we're going to live stream from my house here uh, today. And so welcome to my home. Uh, if you've been following our video devotionals, you've maybe seen this place a little bit before, but, uh, but just want to I want to welcome you to this time that we have here to worship, and it can be very distracting. I'm just speaking for myself when we have all of these other things going on and, and our routines are thrown out of, out of whack and so forth. I would really encourage you, and one of the things that I've been praying about this morning is that our, our hearts, our attention would still be focused uh, today on on what uh, on, on what matters, and that's to as as uh, as Luther puts it in his explanation of the the third commandment to remember the Sabbath day that that our focus would be on on gladly hearing God's word, and uh, we're going to talk about God's word and the, the the power of it and the importance and the primacy of it in our lives today. And so I'm looking forward to sharing uh, some of these verses with you from Jeremiah. I want to just share a couple of announcements briefly. While uh, while I have you here, and you'll see me looking off to the side, I have another computer screen set up, and a lot of this was put together here very last minute, and so ask for your patience through this too with me. But uh, there is Wilderness Camp this week. It's a camp that we are uh, affiliated with, that we encourage and support, and so we're we're having that. Uh, you probably uh, won't see uh, won't see me out there, and uh, and we have to wait and see how some of these test results come back. Uh, I know I'm planning to get tested here in the next day or two just to make sure that 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 nothing uh, is happening that way. But the wilderness camp is still going on and encourage you, invite you to go out there and be a part of of that time, uh, Tuesday through Sunday. Chapel services are at at uh, it says seven o'clock, but I'm I'm pretty sure it's seven thirty. Um, so uh, maybe just stay tuned for some announcements on that. Also, if you're if you're not quite sure. Uh, what that what, what what that is. Uh, if you do go out and St. Paul's uh, hosts the Wednesday night service, bring a lawn chair. The services are all going to be outside uh, this year. Uh, because of that, there's no Bible study on Wednesday, so there won't be any Zoom link being sent out. A youth group is also not meeting, uh, but they uh, they are uh, planning to meet at the church at 545 and uh, and then we'll be leaving the church at six in order to attend the service out there, which again, I'm pretty sure it's at seven now that I'm seeing that a couple of times. They should be back to St. Paul's by about 10 o'clock. And so uh, if you have any questions with that, please talk to Aaron or Rachel. We have church softball again uh, this week uh, at 7 o'clock on Thursday at Centennial Park in Moorhead. Come out for that. Bring a lawn chair. Uh, great outdoor, uh, socially distant activity for you to enjoy uh, some time of fellowship. And I uh, wanted to also let you know we right now are going to plan to have our regular in-person worship on uh um, next Sunday, but but we will be looking at that uh, here in the in the days to come. And so please just stay tuned, uh, check your email, check Facebook, and if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to call um, any of us pastors or the church office, and we can help you. But uh, but for right now, we're planning to have church next Sunday at our regular time, ten o'clock, and then the following Monday, uh, the twentieth, we will have coffee and conversation also at two o'clock, and so you can plan uh, plan to join us then. That's all the announcements I have. As far as prayer requests go, keep praying for those families that have lost loved ones here these last couple of months. And, and pray, too, for those who are, are sick with uh, COVID-19. Uh, pray for healing for them and, and for rest, for recovery, for protection for all of us. Uh, not, just, uh, not just those of us who are at the funeral on Wednesday, but, uh, but, but for all of us, that, that God would protect us, that God would preserve our health. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we are grateful to you for this day that you have made. Uh, we're glad for it. We rejoice in it. Lord, we uh, thank you that this is an opportunity for us to sit down and to open your word and to gladly hear it and learn it. And so I pray that that would be the case today. I pray, Lord, that you would um, sanctify your word in our hearts as we study it. Uh, your word is truth. Uh, Lord, I, I, I pray that as, as I dig into this text here now in the book of Jeremiah, that, uh, that, that you would soften our hearts to hear what it says. 
I pray, God, that you would make us students of your word, and I pray that you would bless this time uh, that we have together now as a church family uh, centered around your, your word. In your name I pray, amen. We're going to do things very differently. It's going to be very uh, truncated and and brief, uh, but I am going to share a sermon. I had a sermon prepared for you, and it's from the book of Jeremiah, like I just prayed. And so I'm going to read that text and then and and then uh, share with you some of my thoughts on it. And so it's uh, it's Jeremiah chapter 28, and you can turn uh, your Bibles there uh, with me. You'll notice I'm not in a shirt and tie either today. And I was going to make, make a mention about that. This is the one time I feel like I have an excuse to not wear a shirt and tie or a suit to church. So if that's a problem, please forgive me. Uh, anyway, we are in Jeremiah chapter 28 and beginning with verse 5, reading through verse 9 in Jesus' name. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to Hananiah the prophet in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord make the words that you have prophesied come true and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. Yet hear now this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine, and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of the prophet comes to pass, Then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. It's no secret that you and I live in an unprecedented time where we have access to information in quantities that uh, were previously unheard of. Obviously, the Internet, Google searches, Wikipedia are the primary examples of that. I I get sad every time I I, uh, hear about someone looking to get rid of their set of encyclopedias. Our family had a set growing up. Maybe yours did too. I remember as a kid just being engrossed by the sheer volume of information that could be found in in our set of Britannicas, if you had that set also. And in what felt like the blink of an eye, these large, expensive sets of books became obsolete. And now if families still display a set of encyclopedias in their home, it's usually for decorative or nostalgic reasons. Many have sadly found their way to the dumpster or the burn barrel. But but books in general are still useful, and there are a lot of books out there, right? Scads of them. For our purposes today, just to talk exclusively about the genre of Christian books, I mean, we're talking about hundreds of thousands, millions of, of, of Christian books, literature, pamphlets, all that kind of stuff. Any one of them can be on our tablets in a matter of seconds or in our hands within two days, thanks to Amazon Prime. We have access to so much information and so many books nowadays. And how many of them contain false teaching? That's a question we're not super comfortable with. But it's a question that Jeremiah had to deal with in our text. And I bring it up this way because even though it's not a comfortable question, it's one that we ought not to shy away from. We can't just ignore it either. We read more articles, more books and blogs. We listen to podcasts, okay? Uh, Here's a rhetorical question just kind of for fun. How many of you in the last three months of live streaming chose to check out another church just because now it's more accessible and easier to do so. And I'm not condemning that in any way, okay? But I'm bringing it up because it's a very relevant example of how easy it is to go and get information and hear sermons and teachings. We have access to so much today, and so much of it is wrong. And I'm just being honest. It's false teaching. It's heresy. And we have to be honest about that and because we have to learn how to discern the truth. I guarantee you that you all have been exposed to false teachings. It, it's impossible not to be exposed to it in this age of information and technology. And if what I've said hasn't hit home yet, let me tell you about the Facebook memes that you have been exposed to. Okay, I won't go down that road today. Here's an example. I brought some books uh, with me from my bookshelf uh, at church. Uh, This uh, here, I grabbed them last night in my office. Here is a book that was written 
101 years ago, and it has a chapter in it on prevenient grace, which is a controversy that almost split the AFLC 30 years ago. Here's a book that teaches, oh, this one here, a book that teaches that hell doesn't exist. Okay, and if you wonder why I even own a book like this, it's because I've worked with so many youth over the years who were exposed to either this book or to its author. Here's a book that I read and, and actually really enjoyed until it became clear that the author didn't believe in what we call the third use of the law. He had some skewed ideas on atonement and frankly got himself into some antinomianism, which basically says that the law has no impact on the life of the Christian and that we have freedom to live however we want, whatever we want, and do anything we want, even if it's against God's law. It's an abusive understanding of God's grace. And these authors all call themselves Christians. Two of them are Lutherans. And it's not my job to judge <laughs> their souls, the, the eternal destiny of, of their souls, okay? But I say it that way simply because in today's day and age, names and titles don't necessarily mean what they used to. Just because someone says they're a Christian or a Lutheran doesn't mean that we agree with them. We need to know what we believe and why. And we do that, we learn that, we test it, everything against Scripture. We need to be students of the word. Jeremiah 28 and some of the surrounding chapters, the prophet confronts false prophets. And that's what he's doing in our text. Jeremiah was not well liked by the king of Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel. Really, nobody liked Jeremiah because the message that he brought of uh, the people was one of judgment and destruction and, and captivity. Hard realities that no one likes to hear. But it was God's word to the people. And so it was true. In chapter 25 of Jeremiah, uh, the prophet says that Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon is going to come and, and take them captive for 70 years because of Israel's disobedience, because of their idolatry. Now, nobody likes to hear that. But some of the people were so enraged that they threatened Jeremiah's life. And then in, in, ch in chapter 26... And then in chapter 27, there's a, a fight between some of the other prophets of the day about whether they should fight back against the Babylonians when they come. There were those who were saying that they could avoid this captivity if they just fought hard enough. And Jeremiah pleaded with them to see this for what it was, a righteous judgment from God. Leave it alone and your lives will be spared, he said. God had promised to free them after 70 years while the people didn't listen. And this filters into chapter 28 then where we meet this man, Hananiah, who came in and said, this is what God has told me. Hey, by the way, if you ever hear someone or read a book today or a blog or a podcast or whatever, it says, God told me, be very careful with that. Scripture, again, our test is very clear that God has spoken through his prophets, through his apostles here. And if someone is claiming direct revelation from God, that's, that's a scary thing. Now, they could be saying that, that God had taught them a truth through God's word or something like that. But, but when they use that phrase, God told me, that's, that, that, that's, a, that's a red flag, to be honest. And so Hananiah comes in and he says, this is what God told me. God says that he has broken the yoke of the king of Babylon, that he won't enslave you anymore, and that it's only two years that then everything will be restored and made right. Not 70, like Jeremiah is saying. Who likes that? Okay, verse 5. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to Hananiah the prophet in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord make the words that you have prophesied come true and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. Jeremiah's response here, friends, is very interesting. It would have been very easy for him to forcefully denounce the words of this false prophet. It may have been easier for him uh, or to, to, to keep his mouth shut or to wait for the, 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 the crazed crowds to calm down after hearing this gloriously good news that, that, that it's only going to be two years of hardship instead of 70. For Jeremiah to wait until they came to their senses to address this problem. Instead, what Jeremiah does here is express sympathy and affirmation that he is with them in his desire for Hananiah to be correct. It would be really nice 
if God's judgment only lasted two years after he initially said it would be 70. That sounds great. Amen, he says. May it be so. The prophet is not afraid here to confess that that's his desire too. To use that example of the book that claims there's no hell. Wouldn't that be nice? That's not true. That's not God's word. One of the common false teachings out there today is what we call like a prosperity or a, a health and wealth gospel. There are a few ways of saying that. The message from those people is that there is great fame and fortune and blessing to be found in Christ. And it talks about having your best life now and the removal of suffering in the world. That's basically what is going on in our text here. Hananiah is saying, you don't need this pain and suffering. You can have your best life now. The false prophet is saying you aren't going to have to suffer. And, and Jeremiah sympathizes with that. It's true that no one likes to suffer. And it would be really nice, excuse me, if we didn't have to. But, or Jeremiah uses the word yet in verse 7. Yet hear now the word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times, they prophesied war, famine, and pestilence. You see, as much as we might like to see suffering and judgment removed, one person saying so, even in the name of God, doesn't change what God has already said in his word. As much as Jeremiah loved his country and loved the people of his country and would have loved to have seen them spared from this judgment, do you hear Jeremiah's love coming through in his response? As much as he would have loved to see them spared from this judgment, there was a greater allegiance that he carried, and it was allegiance to the authority of God's word. As great as that sounds, it's not what God's word says. The prophets who have gone before have all said something different. God has said something different through them. Now, I realize this is kind of basic, but it really needs to be said. We really need to be reminded of this on a regular basis. Test everything you hear with Scripture. Even if it sounds really good and you really like it, is it what Scripture says? And if it's not, then it's not from God. The guy uh, that I alluded to here that wrote this book on, on hell not existing wrote another book called Velvet Elvis. So interesting name. In that book, he questions the virgin birth, which is one of the fundamental tenets of the Christian faith. We, 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 we confess it every week in the Apostles' Creed. As I was reading that book many years ago, he made a very convincing argument based on Jewish cultural history. And on the surface, it sounded very plausible, and the points he was making from it were kind of enticing to some. So what do you do in a situation like that? For that book, it meant going back and, and, and not just checking the bibliography, okay? If you ever think that the bibliography is a waste of space and, and, and ink and paper, it's not. And even though his bibliography was filled with Bible verses, I checked his Jewish sources and I looked those people up. So you have to do some deep digging a couple of layers down. And I found that, that the Jewish sources that he had, that he was basing all of his points on, had a very low view of Scripture and no problem basing their assertions on more convenient realities than what Scripture clearly teaches. Are we willing to submit ourselves to what Scripture says, even if it's not convenient? Jeremiah called Hananiah out on that. What you say sounds great, but it's not what the Bible says. Even that sounds kind of elementary, doesn't it? Submit to the Bible. But that is so hard for our old natures. See, think about this with me. What's missing from Hananiah's prophecy? I know we didn't read it at the beginning. You can look back at the first verses of Jeremiah 28. But it's in those verses right before our text that, that Jeremiah comes in and says, Be because of your, your sin and your idolatry, you're going to end up, be in exile for 70 years. And, and so Hananiah comes and he says, no, that's all good. It's only going to be two years. What's the purpose of God's judgment? What's the purpose of God's law? 
That's the question for us today. We say that it's to convict of sin, to, to drive us to Christ, to call us to repentance, and then in the gospel to believe in the forgiveness that is afforded us in faith. You see, Hananiah is fine to skip over that whole conviction and contrition from the law part of this. There's no call to repent, to turn, to seek forgiveness. He comes in and he simply says, everything's going to be great. There's no acknowledgement of sin and, and judgment for sin. And friends, that's just not what God's word says. In verse 9, Jeremiah says, if this guy keeps talking about peace, let's just wait and see if that's what actually happens. We will find out who's telling the truth and who's lying. And if you think about it, the same is true for those today who would argue that faith brings temporal prosperity or riches or health. Is that true? If we believe hard enough, we can have everything our heart desires. Can we live to a ripe old age? We might. But if we do, it's not because we believed the right way. It's just because God is good and gracious to us. And even if we don't live to a ripe old age, God's goodness and grace is no less ours than if we did live longer. And it's because of what the Bible says. To use Jeremiah's thought process, his direction. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say about our own souls and our own salvation? It says we are dead in our trespasses and sins. It says we deserve God's wrath. It says we are living today in exile. And it's going to be that way until God chooses to bring us home. Not when someone else might say so. And until he does, there is going to be a measure of suffering and hurt. We are going to struggle and sin. But friends, God will see us through. Acknowledge your sin. Confess it. Don't deny it or try to redefine it or, or fight to avoid it like the Israelites were told by these false prophets to avoid God's judgment. Instead, confess it. And then believe in God's promise. Jeremiah 25, 12 says, Then after 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation for their iniquity, declares the Lord. In other words, God will make things right. That's God's promise. God will win the day. And friends, that day for us, sitting on this side of, of history, that day was won at the cross. Those things that cause us suffering and, and harm and temptation, sin, death, the devil. It was defeated when Jesus went to the cross. And because of his atoning sacrifice and his victories over the grave, we have assurance that someday our exile will end. Not because any man said it. And made it in such a way as to avoid dealing with the reality of our exile and why the world is this way. And why it is not the way that it was meant to be. But all things will be made right and we can be assured of that because God has said so and that it will happen in his timing and according to his will. And it's because of the cross. It's because of the empty tomb. I want to read uh, a quote here for you. Uh, and you've maybe heard this before, it's from a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And as we think about this, this concept of, of, of Hananiah who tried to avoid the reality of, of sin or the reality of, of, of God's judgment, the reality of the need for repentance and, and confession of sin that way. Because what happens is that God's grace then gets redefined. But when we confess our sins, what does the Bible say? God is faithful. He keeps his promise. God is just. He forgives us our sins. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And so Bonhoeffer was talking about this cheap grace. And he contrasts it with costly grace. It says cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. 
communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is, is grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. It says costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field. And I think that's such a beautiful thing because, because this costly grace is a treasure for us. And it's hidden in the field. It says, for the sake of it, a man will go and sell all that he has. It is a pearl of great price to buy, which the merchant will sell all his goods. It is the kingly rule of Christ. And friends, that's my prayer for, 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 for myself and for each and every one of us, that, that we would see the cost of grace. Not that it costs us anything, but that it cost Jesus Christ his life. And when we believe that, it, the, the, the cross convicts us of our sin. It shows us how much we need forgiveness. But it shows us, in the most beautiful way possible, the love of Christ. That he was willing to die for us. This is what God's word says. We don't ignore it. We don't sweep it under the rug. We don't redefine it. We acknowledge and confess what the Bible says. And when we do that, we find great promise, great blessing in the faithfulness and the righteousness of Christ. And that is a treasure that is ours today by faith. Live today in the word of God and his promise for you. Let's pray. Father, I am grateful to you today for your word. I'm grateful that your word does not fail. And even when your word says things that maybe aren't convenient or maybe don't sound the way that we would like them to sound or they aren't what we'd like them to be, God, forgive us for our rebellion, for our idolatry. Teach us to humbly submit to your word. And God, teach us to, to love your grace and your mercy, and your promise that you will see us through, and that you will bless us. Maybe not in the ways that we always think about or dream, but God, our dreams are so finite. You have heaven waiting for us. You have eternity. We can't even fathom what that is like. It's so much better than anything we could ever hope to imagine. Help us, God, to find our rest and our hope and our joy in you and in your promise and in your goodness to us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the treasure that that is. Help us to cling to it, to submit to it, to learn it, to study it, to love it. I pray, God, that your word would be close to our hearts each and every day. Let's pray together. Please join me in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go today, friends, in God's peace. May the peace and the love of Christ direct your heart and your steps today and each day. God bless you. Bye now.